everyone wounds themselves. Now, when I was a kid, I broke most of my fingers and toes on our regular misadventures. But 20 years ago, I flew off my push bike and used my face as a brake on the bitumen. I don't recommend it. But all I had to do was keep the wounds clean and covered, and I healed. But not everyone does. Some people suffer from chronic wounds. These are wounds that just don't heal. Imagine getting a cut in your foot, and a week later it hasn't healed. You go to the doctor, get antibiotics, and it still doesn't seem to help. A month later, you go to hospital and with a weepy mess. All they can do is scratch it, clean out the gunk, and bandage it every day. This happens to a lot of people, especially military personnel, the elderly, smokers, and diabetics. It sounds horrific, and it is, but it's not as uncommon as you think. One to two percent of people will have these chronic wounds at some point. Now, diabetes is a big problem. It affects five to 15 percent of the world. That's 500 million people diagnosed with diabetes. In Australia, it's 7 percent, and that's 1.7 million of us. And it's increasing by 100,000 people every year. Now, you've heard of insulin injections as a treatment for diabetes, and that helps some, but it doesn't help chronic wounds. 15% of these diabetics will have a chronic wound at some point, and this wound gets deep. It just keeps getting deeper, often gets to the bone, and one in 10 of these will require an amputation. Even those that don't have an amputation often require four to five months in hospital with regular daily treatment, and this is all really, really expensive. It costs the world $50 billion to treat. Despite all this treatment, 12 Aussies a day are losing a foot to diabetes, and around the world, every 30 seconds, someone is losing a foot to diabetes. Now, for a little bit about me. I love worms. Not the worms in your garden, but the worms in your guts. Ooh, they're gross, they're disgusting, ooh. And you're right, but they're amazing. Over the millennia, they've developed an amazing array of biological defenses to dodge and hide in our immune system. The parasitic blood fluke, for example, is like a marine sniper hiding in the environment. They wear camouflage clothing to hide into the trees, and the blood fluke makes bits that look like us so they can hide. And just like the marine covers himself in leaves to further hide in the environment, the blood fluke does the same. It sticks bits of your blood onto it, so it's hiding from your internal police force, the immune system. But this is where you find the one that fascinates me the most, the Thai liver fluke, Opisthorchus vivarani. It's found throughout Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, and infects nine million people. And it's deadly. It causes a particularly dangerous form of liver cancer that kills 26,000 Thais every year. Why is it restricted to this particular region? Well, it's the environment. The particular animals and the freshwater streams are all critical for its survival. When you're infected with the worm, you'll poop out the eggs every day, and during the monsoon season, they'll get flushed into local streams. A snail comes along and munches up the eggs. Within the snail, the egg hatches and multiplies and bursts out like a fish-targeting missile. And this looks like a microscopic tadpole. It wriggles around and eventually finds a fish until it insists in the fish flesh. The locals catch these local, kind of like a small little carp or almost a goldfish. They catch these little fish, put them in giant earthenware jars and add these local ants to the dish. They ferment them for a few days and it becomes something, something like fish sauce before it's fish sauce. And it's delicious. They mix it up with herbs and serve it as a fish mince called plara. Once it's eaten, it activates in your guts and crawls up into your liver. Here it grows into a one centimetre or half inch long parasitic flatworm that's the shape of a leaf. And it can live for decades. Now, as a tourist, it's not such a problem because you can take a pill to get rid of it but the locals are continually eating these fish as it's their major protein source, and they get heavily infected all the time. But this worm is munching around your liver and causing wounds as it goes. But it's actually got an amazing superpower, wound healing worm spit. Just like if you knock a hole in your wall at home, you're going to fix it up. And the worm's doing the same thing, but it's home to your liver. With its wound healing worm spit, it's healing the wounds as it goes, as it munches around, and keeping its home nice and healthy for decades. But what does this mean for the rest of us who aren't infected with the worm? Well, maybe we can steal its superpower. Maybe we could use it for good. 
So that's what we're trying to do in the lab. Now, we would never be able to grow enough worms to harvest all of this worm spit to use as a treatment. But if we could find the active ingredient, we might be able to use it. And that's what I was able to do. We identified the active ingredient that causes wound healing in worm spit, and it's named granulin. It's similar to some uh, components in us that are uh, involved in development and wound healing. And it's got this really amazing structure. It forms a spring shape, and it's held together tightly with bonds. Now, while this is fascinating to study, it makes it really expensive, really tricky, and really messy to make. So we'd never be able to turn it into a pharmaceutical. But maybe we don't need the whole molecule. Maybe we just need a little bit of it. And that's what we test in the lab, a whole range of different bits of it in the lab. We are able to make it with amino acids and gluing them together, bit at a time, to make it synthetically. And that's allowed us to make these various different active molecules to test in our studies. So then we ran our tests through some healing mouse wounding tests. Here the mice are anaesthetized and kept on painkillers when we make a small wound between their ears. We photographed this over days and watched those wounds close, and we measure how long it takes to get to 80% closure. So here's our baseline healing rate of 8.6 days of our no treatment control. Uh, when compared against the currently available biologic treatment, it was able to improve healing by 29%. Now, this treatment's only available in Korea and the USA and costs over $3,000 a treatment. Our granulin protein was able to heal wounds 41% faster. But even better, our synthetic granulin that's able to make cleanly and cheaply healed in 4.9 days. That's 43% better than controls and almost 50% better than the currently available treatment. So we think we're onto a winner, something that can be made cheaply, cleanly, and is effective at wound healing. But this isn't all about graphs and figures, it's about people. Imagine going to the doctor and getting diagnosed with a chronic wound that's reached the bone. You're going to need an amputation. This isn't just going to change your life, it's going to change everyone around you. It wasn't anything you did, it wasn't anything that could have been prevented. Chronic wounds are just horrible in this way. But what if you could have had a cream, some kind of treatment that could have supercharged your wound healing, like our worm spit? that might have been able to heal that chronic wound and avoid that amputation. And this is a really big deal because diabetics who get an amputation, only half of them will survive for more than five years due to all the horrible complications. So it's a really big impact on their lives. So hopefully, with the right funding, we're a few years away of getting some kind of treatment that might be able to go into humans and help the million diabetics who are on track every single year to lose a limb. So remember, don't eat raw fish in Thailand, worm spit heals wounds, and a new treatment might be just around the corner to help diabetic chronic wounds and avoid these amputations. Thank you.